These are fresh collards. And this is the yam. These are important parts of who I am. Now this, this is cornbread. Yeah, baked in a skillet. My roots grow deep in American soil, so deep that I can feel it. So on any given day, at any given meal, I take what I got and I mix till it feels smooth and delicious and flavorful and hot. My grandmothers brought these flavors through the great migration, and now it's cooked up in my pots. I remember the lessons deep down in my soul, and I remember the recipes made in my grandmother's bowls. The recipes that I grew up with are tried and true. Collard greens, Hoppin' Johns, and a handful of beans for a good measure or two. So good evening, everyone. My name is Chef Michelle Wilson, and I am the sixth generation of eight generations of my family that are proud to call themselves American. Our genealogical chart goes back and we can name generations going back as far as my second great grandfather who was in the Revolutionary War, excuse me, the Civil War. And he was a freeman in 1850. And that's not just black history, that is American history. So um, I do want to thank our host this evening, Miss Lauren Riley, as well as I want to thank the Somerset County Library Systems for inviting me out this evening to talk to you about the food and the folks of the Great Migration. Now, if I were a singer, oh, I would sing you a song, a beautiful melody to last the whole day long. And if I were a musician, I would be playing you some notes, hypnotic, rhapsodic, to make your heart flute. Because all of us have something that we do well. And my name is Chef Michelle Wilson. And not only am I a great chef, but I have stories to tell. So tonight, I'm going to be talking to you about um, the people who were a part of the Great Migration, the foods that they ate along the way, and the way that those foods transitioned into many of the soul food products that we have today. Can you see that? Yeah, okay, there we go. Like this great barbecue sauce. Okay. So, again, um, I want to give you a little bit of a background about the Great Migration. Now, as, as hard as you may find this to believe, around 1875, around the end of Reconstruction, there was an election that was controversial. And it was hard to decide. They were going back and forth on which president had won the election. So in order to have a compromise, the South and the North decided to compromise over the election. And one of the things that the South wanted was for federal troops that had been put in place to kind of help the formerly enslaved people ease into life after emancipation. There were federal troops put in place in the South. And um, the South said, I'll tell you what, if you get rid of the federal troops, then you can have the president that you think you elected. So that was one of the things that impacted things like the Jim Crow laws, 
um, a lot of laws of segregation. And there was um, a lot of financial strife going on. Um, the recently emancipated slaves, the uh, Black people were trying to adjust to life and freedom. The system of sharecropping was put into place where um, the formerly enslaved were there to grow the crops. They, they agreed to stay on the farm and in the plantation and say, okay, we'll help grow the crops. And the former plantation owner, the former master said, okay, well then I'll tell you what, I'll give you the seeds, you plant the crops, you work the farm, you harvest the crops, and we'll split the profit. Only problem was there wasn't much of a profit to go around. And in addition to that, there was a problem with the cotton crop. Now, at that time in the United States, cotton was king. And cotton was a large part of the American economy, particularly in the South. The South grew the cotton and it was, um, you know, put on looms and turned into fabric and cloth, which then went to the North where they made clothes and manufactured items that were also sold in Europe. So cotton was king in the United States. And then, there was a major problem with a little insect called the boll weevil. And the boll weevil is a pesky little bug that eats the cotton flower. And when the boll weevil infested the cotton crop of the South, I mean, it just ate its way all the way from Texas, all the way through the Carolinas, and um, cotton was, it was abysmal and, and there was a drought. So um, Northern America was just becoming industrialized. Places like uh, Newark, New Jersey had patent leather factories and the automobile was, you know, being mechanized and starting to roll off the assembly line. And um, the farmer in the South, you know, he was like, well, what am I going to do with this boll weevil problem? It's killing my crops. Cotton is down to a quarter of a pound. And so this is a fictional conversation between a farmer and a boll weevil. Let me tell you about a story about a boll weevil. Now, some of you may not know, but a boll weevil is a little insect and he's found mostly where cotton grows. Now, where he comes from, nobody really knows, but this is the way that the story goes. The farmer said to the boll weevil, I see you're out here on the square. Bull Weevil said to the farmer, say, yep, yeah, my whole darn family is here because we got to have a home. Oh, we got to have a home. Well, the farmer said to the Bull Weevil, say, why did you pick my farm? The Weevil just laughed at the farmer and said, oh, we're not going to do you much harm. We're just, we're just looking for a home. Well, the boll weevil, he spotted a lightning bug. He said, hey, I'd like to make a trade with you. Because you see, if I was a lightning bug, I'd search the whole night through just looking for a home. I'd have me plenty of homes. Well, the boll weevil called the farmer and he said, you better sell those old machines because when I'm through with your cotton crop, huh, you won't even be able to buy gasoline because I'm going to stake me a home because we got to have a home. Well, the boll weevil said to the farmer, he said, farmer, I'd like to wish you well 
And the farmer said to the bull weevil, I wish you would go to H-E double hockey sticks. And the bull weevil said, I'm still looking for a home. I'm just looking for a home. Well, the bull weevil wasn't the only entity looking for a home. The economy was wrecked. America was dependent on King Cotton and there just was not enough cotton or money to go around. Not only that, but after the federal troops left the South, uh, that's when the KKK became very active. And there were a lot of lynchings. Sometimes entire families were lynched. There was an average of a lynching every other day. So there was no justice. There were no jobs. There was an insect infestation in the cotton. There was a drought sweeping through the South. So one day in 1916, a family of Black people packed up in Selma, Alabama and left. They just said, we out. And that was the beginning of the Great Migration. The Great Migration was a time between 1916 and 1970 when more than 6 million Black Americans moved from the rural South to cities in the North, Midwest, and West looking for a better life for their family and mostly for their children. Ray Charles wrote a song about it. He said, yeah, my bills are all due and the baby needs shoes, but I'm busted. Cotton is down to a quarter a pound, but I'm busted. I got a cow that went dry and a hen that won't lay. Big stacks of bills getting bigger each day day, the county is going to come and haul my possessions away. And I'm busted. Well, I went to my brother to ask for a loan because I was busted. And I hated to beg like a dog for a bone. But I'm busted. But my brother, he said, there ain't a thing I can do. My wife, and my children are also down with the flu. And I was just thinking about calling on you because I'm busted. Now, I'm no thief, but a man can go wrong when he's busted. The food that we canned last summer, ooh, it's almost gone and I'm busted. Well, the fields are all bare and the cotton won't grow. And my family and me, we had to pick up and go. And I'll make a living somehow. I don't know, but I'm busted. So they began leaving, going north, going west, and when the Great Migration began, 90% of all African-Americans were living in the South. But by the end of 1919, some 1 million Black people had left the South, usually traveling by train or by bus. Some people came by boat up the coast from Florida into places like uh, they came from Florida into Philadelphia, into that port by boat. A smaller number had automobiles. Some people even came on horse-drawn carts. People said, I'm out. I'm leaving on the first thing smoking, even if it's a man with a cigar. So people began to arrive in the new northern cities. Recruiters from places like Detroit went down into the south and talked Black men into leaving to go and get a job. Women, families, 
people packed up, so many people were packing up and leaving that the farmers began to get concerned. They said, who, who, who's going to pick these crops? I mean, it wasn't just cotton. There was also tobacco. There were peanuts. There were other crops that had to be harvested. And with the Black population leaving to go north, the white population was beginning to get a little concerned about who, who's going to do this work to the extent that sometimes people had to be deceptive about leaving. There were families who would send their possessions ahead by train, just pack a trunk, send it to Philadelphia to a relative that had already migrated north. And then when it was time to go, they would come down to the train station and maybe the farmer that they worked for, if they were short sharecroppers would say, oh, where are y'all going? Oh, we're just going up to my sister's in the next town. But when the train got past the next town, they stayed on board and they kept on going. Many new arrivals found jobs in factories, slaughterhouses in Chicago and foundries where conditions were arduous and sometimes dangerous, but it was better than sharecropping. African-American males and females were helping building America's railroads. It wasn't easy work. But earning a dollar a day, that was considered a lot of money. My great aunt Charlotte, who was my grandmother's aunt, left South Carolina in 1920 and moved to Philadelphia. I wish that I knew how or why or where she found the courage to pack up and leave her family and move to a city. But a lot of times people, she came to Philadelphia, people who came to Philadelphia, especially from South Carolina, they had a pretty good foothold because there were entire communities in South Carolina that picked up and moved to North Philadelphia, particularly between Spring Garden Streets and Columbia Avenue. And the whole community lived there. Sometimes the whole church, including the pastor, picked up and moved to Philadelphia. And then each one would reach back and bring someone else along. My Aunt Charlotte, where's my, where's my prop? My Aunt Charlotte helped my grandmother out by taking my two uncles with her. My two uncles were little boys and my grandmother had a new baby at home who was my mother. And so her aunt took the two little boys to Philadelphia. She didn't have any children of her own. So she took my two uncles to Philadelphia where at the ages of seven and eight, they became little shoeshine boys. Now this was a good way for a young child, and sometimes grown-ups too, were on a corner and they had their own little station. And my uncles, they were smart learners. So what they did was they had their shoe shine stands, their shoe shine box. It was basically just a crate for a man to put his foot up on, and then they were down shining the shoes, but they were outside of a barber shop. And then they moved inside the barber shop. So when men came in to get a shave and a haircut, my uncles were little boys and they were there to shine shoes and they learned how to cut hair and they became barbers. Now, eventually they both went into the military. Uh, my uncle Jimmy, that was my mother's oldest brother, he was actually on Iwo Jima. And um, my mother's second brother, he was in the Air Force and Uncle Jimmy was in the Navy and he was on Iwo Jima. So we have a long history with military in our family. And it started with, you know, that second great grandfather who was in the Civil War. And even until this day, our family is represented in the US Armed Forces and we're very proud of them. 
So um, Aunt Charlotte, she had the two little boys and they, you know, did the shoe shine thing and they worked in the barber shops and then they enlisted in the military. Meanwhile, my grandmother came north and by that time my mother was five years old and they came from Columbia, South Carolina. And uh, my grandmother had been a domestic cook in Columbia, South Carolina. So when she came to Philadelphia, she was able to find work in people's homes as a domestic cook. Now, meanwhile, on my father's side, that family came from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And my, that grandmother was also a domestic cook. And her husband, who everybody called the old man, he, it said that he could bake the best rolls. And her husband actually worked on the Reading Seashore Railroad line. There were, um, that was a great place for people to get work. If they had been um, a house servant during slavery or a house slave, they could get jobs on the railroad as a Pullman porter. And there were also women who had taken care of children in the South. They got jobs on the train and they were dressed in a white uniform as a nurse and they took care of the little white children that were on the train and that were sleeping in the Pullman cards. So they continued to do their work as like a nursemaid and the men continued their work as a Pullman porter. And then other men were out actually working on the railroad. And those were the Gandhi dancers. And it wasn't because they were doing a dance dance. It was because the movement that they used to lay the rails was what they called a dance. And sometimes they would sing a work song and they would, uh, it was like a shuffle movement and they had to lift that rail and put it in place. And they were called Gandhi dancers. Gandhi because Gandhi manufactured the tool that they used to put the, the um, rails into place. So my grandmother uh, from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, her name was Velma Brown. And she and her husband, they were, they had great culinary skills. And so what they did was they decided to open a little restaurant. And their restaurant was called the Cozy Nook. So now here's the thing. People, when they came north, when they traveled, especially if they came by bus or they came by car, they really could not stop along the way due to segregation. They couldn't stop along the way and eat in a restaurant. People used the Green Book. And you may have seen the movie by the same title. Um, I don't know that the movie had that much to do with the actual Green Book, but the Green Book was like a traveler's guide. As a matter of fact, um, it says, um, it said the green book, it says, you know, you can travel for vacation without aggravation, right? Because who needs aggravation when you're on vacation, right? Aggravation meaning you get someplace, you want to go get something to eat, only to find out you're not being, we don't serve your kind here. So now you got to go a little bit further down the road, try to find some place. You didn't want to be aggravated. You didn't want to be embarrassed. And you certainly did not want to get injured over trying to get a bologna sandwich. So, um, so the Green Book, Mr. Green came up with the Green Book. And that's what people used when they traveled so that they could find a safe place to stop and eat. Also, people packed their own lunches. So what did they bring? Well, chicken, of course. Now, fried chicken is a good thing to bring along because chicken does not have to be hot and it doesn't have to be cold. It's okay to eat chicken room temperature. So they brought a lot of chicken. It was good protein, lasted a while, long enough for you to eat it. And... Um, 
it didn't have to be, you know, particularly refrigerated to be served well, as long as you ate it, you know, within a couple of hours. Um, people also brought pound cake. Now, people brought pound cake because um, pound cake kept well. It didn't have icing on it. It didn't have frosting. And it was nice and solid. And it wasn't messy. And it was something that they could take. And of course, people usually had mm, a couple of biscuits with them to eat with their chicken, chicken and bread. And they would bring something to drink along. So um, after people got to the city, not only you know were they looking for some place where they could go and eat, but you know they missed having soul food. I mean, where were you going to get some really good skillet cornbread? Where were you going to get those smothered pork chops? Where were you going to get some good barbecue? people began to have Sunday dinners. And when they had a Sunday dinner, the family could get together and, um, you know, usually after church and they had a big meal. And then sometimes other people would say, well, is it okay if I come to the dinner? So guess what? People began to sell dinners. People began to sell a fried chicken platter and people were willing to pay money. So my grandmother, Velma from Louisiana and the old man who could bake the rolls, they opened a little restaurant on the front, the first floor of their home in North Philadelphia called the Cozy Nook. And it said that they made some of the best smothered pork chops, collard greens and cornbread in the city of Philadelphia. So that's how a lot of soul food restaurants got started just from people selling dinners, people coming by the house after church on Sunday and wanting you know, to stop in and get some really good food. Now, um, like I mentioned, people were working on the railroad and you know, people came from all walks of life. And there were some people, especially some of those women that worked on the railroad they were some tough customers and they would let you know, no loser, no weeper. I hate to lose something. She said, I hate to lose something. Then she bowed her head. Even a dime makes me wish I was dead. I can't explain it, but no more need be said except I hate to lose something. I lost a doll once and I cried for a week. She was such a lovely doll. She could open her eyes and do anything but speak. I think she got took by some doll snatch and sneak. I tell you, I hate to lose something. A watch of mine just got up and walked away. It had 12 numbers on it for every hour of the day. I'll never forget that watch, but all that I can say is that I really hate to lose something. Now, if I felt that way about a watch, and I felt that way about a toy, Madam, how do you think I feel about my lover boy? Now, I'm not threatening you, lady, but he is my evening's joy. And I'm telling you, I hate to lose something. So yes, I Hate to Lose Something by Maya Angelou is a description of how it sometimes went down. Some of those sisters that worked on those railroads, as the old people say, they didn't take no tea for the fever. And then there were those people who came north looking for a wonderful life. And maybe 
it didn't quite work out the way that they had dreamed. Langston Hughes addressed this issue in his poem, What Happens to a Dream Deferred. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a sore and then rot? Does it, does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over to a syrupy sweet? Or maybe it just sags, yeah, like a heavy load. Or does it, does it explode? A dream deferred. A Dream Deferred by Langston Hughes came out of the Harlem Renaissance. And the Harlem Renaissance came out of the Great Migration, the first part of the Great Migration before World War II birthed the Harlem Renaissance. And the second half of the Great Migration, which started around 1950 after the end of World War II, after the GIs came back and people started get packing up and moving again, after the, the Great Depression was over, people began to move again to the North. And this time they also went to the West, and this time they also went like as far, you know, they went to California, they went to Chicago, and people were still moving. The second half of the Great Migration is what birthed the civil rights movement. Now, people would gather together in their homes again on a Sunday afternoon, and being that, you know, they really because of Jim Crow and because of segregation, they couldn't go to any theater that they wanted to. They couldn't go to any movie that they wanted to or any type of concert. So a lot of times people just upgraded their homes and they had the living room as theater. And once people came up North, then their lifestyles changed and they had glitz and glamour and they would take that old cook's hat and push it up to the side and find an earring clip and put it on the front. And now they were high fashion and they would deliver an eloquent poem in their living room and it was called the living room as theater. Now, someone always knew a Paul Lawrence Dunbar poem and that every young girl, if you couldn't sing, which I cannot, you were expected to at least be able to give a recitation. Something dramatic and profound like the touch of the master's hand. It was battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it scarcely worth his while to waste much time on an old violin, but he held it up, and with a smile he said, what am I bid for this old violin? Who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar? A dollar. Now two, only two, two dollars, and who'll make it three? And it's three dollars once and three dollars twice and going and going, but no. From the room far back came a gray haired man forward and picked up the bow and wiping the dust off the old violin and tightening up all of its strings. He played a melody so pure and so sweet, as sweet as the angel sing. The music ceased and the auctioneer in a voice that was quiet and low said, now what am I bid for the old violin? And he held it up with the bow. 
A thousand dollars, someone cried. Two thousand, two thousand, three, and it's three thousand once and three thousand twice and going and gone, said he. And the crowd cheered, but some of them cried. We do not quite understand. What changed its worth? And the man replied, the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with his soul out of tune and battered and scarred by sin has been auctioned off cheap to a bartering crowd, much like that old violin. He's going once and going twice and going and almost gone. But the master steps in and the foolish crowd, they never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that is brought by the touch of the master's hand. So every young girl was expected to be able to do a recitation. And the soul food was on and cooking. And people like Sylvia went to places like Harlem and opened up their luncheonettes. And to this day, you can go to Sylvia's in Harlem along with many other soul food restaurants. So where did that term soul food come from? Some people give credit to Amiri Baraka the poet laureate of the state of New Jersey, the late Amiri Baraka, who was born Leroy Jones and changed his name during the civil rights movement. And soul food became a multi, here's my Popeye's box, multi-billion dollar industry. Going through my box of props over here. So now you don't just have to uh, deal with your own fresh collard greens. You can just get a can of glory greens and open them up. Now soul food is a multi-billion dollar industry and Walmart got in on it and a lot of other big box companies and Patty LaBelle has her patty pies and her uh, banana puddings and you know, soul food has taken off and who doesn't like a nice hot piece of fried chicken and a good biscuit. So that is um, kind of how soul food made its transition from the rural South to the North along with the people who came along in the Great Migration. And um, Isabel, Isabella Wilkerson in her book, the, um, the Warmth of Other Sons, talks about the people who came North in the Great Migration and who they became. I mean, some of us became um, Lawrence Jacobs, whose mother came to first Atlantic City and then also into Harlem, where La Lawrence, um, am I thinking of Lawrence Jacobs? Yeah, Jacob Lawrence, I'm sorry. Jacob, it's a little warm in here. Jacob Lawrence um, did the whole migration series with the great um, silkscreen prints uh, new churches sprang up in the North. People like Daddy Grace and Father Divine who started a whole movement based on his thoughts on integration and giving people food. The Divine Lorraine Hotel in Philadelphia was built. There was um, a Divine Hotel in, in uh, New York. And they also gave people food. They fed not just the soul with spirituality, but they also fed the body. And they had great dinners and people were drawn to men like Daddy Grace and Father Divine. 
And another thing about the Great Migration is that when people, especially the men, went north, when they came back down south, they like to roll up in a big fine car, either a Buick, a Pontiac, or if you were really making it big, you showed up back in the south with a Cadillac. And so by the time the 70s came, and the great migration began to slow down. We had people who had migrated and were now feeling so good about themselves. They were ego tripping, like described in the poem by Nikki Giovanni. I was born in the Congo. I walked to the Fertile Crescent and built the Sphinx. I designed a pyramid so tough that a star that only glows every 100 years falls into the center, giving divine and perfect light. I am bad. I sat on a throne drinking nectar with Allah. I got hot, so I sent an ice age to Europe to cool my thirst. My oldest daughter is Nefertiti. The tears from my birth pains created the Nile. I am a beautiful woman. I gazed on a forest and burned out the Sahara Desert. With a packet of goat's meat and a change of clothes, I crossed it in two hours. I am a gazelle, so swift, so swift. You can't catch me. For a birthday present when he was three, I gave my son Hannibal an elephant. He gave me Rome for Mother's Day. My strength flows ever on. My son Noah built a new ark and I stood proudly at the helm as we sailed on a soft summer day. I turned myself into myself and was Jesus. Men intoned my loving name. All praises, all praises. I am the one who would stay. I sowed diamonds in my backyard. My bowels delivered uranium. The filings from my fingernails are semi-precious jewels. On a trip north, I caught a cold and blew my nose giving oil to the Arab world. The hair from my head thinned and gold was laid across three continents. I sailed west to reach east and had to round off the corners of the earth as I went. I am so hit, even my errors are correct. I am so beautiful, so perfect, so ethereal, and so, so surreal that I cannot be comprehended except by my permissions. I mean, I can fly like a bird in the sky. So once again, my name is Michelle Washington Wilson. I am both a storyteller and a chef, and I thank you for tuning in tonight. 